Let's move on to number two, private banks and debt-based money. The vast amount of money created today is done by the private banking sector. In most developed economies, about 97% of the entire money supply is created digitally by banks, and therefore most money in the world is privatised. Banks invented digital money when they managed to persuade lawmakers after many early bank runs. A bank run is an event where depositors try to get their money out all at once, but the banks don't have it. From these events, banks argued that they should be legally allowed to create more deposits than actually exist based upon debt, and this is how governments outsourced the creation of digital money. The idea of using debt as money begins much earlier than this. English innovators set the stage for banks to become the creators of money across the globe. In 1704, the English Parliament passed the Promissory Notes Act. Take a good look at your screen. What you are seeing is a promissory note. In this case, it's a written promise to say that you'll pay back the $20 you borrowed. Under the law, this piece of paper was as good as $20. Today, we digitize this agreement and call it debt. If it helps, whenever I say debt in this episode, you can think of this piece of paper, remembering that it's as good as money. Okay, so banks were authorised to be able to use these debt notes to circulate as money. From this point, banks were free to create and destroy debt and hence money from themselves rented out at interest. In the modern world, as you'll see, the whole world's economy is based upon these promises. Let's take a look at how it works today. When you go to a bank to borrow some money, the banking license gives that bank the ability to create money every time they issue a loan. They do this through the double accounting system. For example, if you buy a $500,000 house, the bank creates $500,000 in their account and you have $500,000 in debt. That is, the promise to pay it back with interest. This $500,000 debt can enter the wider economic system because when you purchase the house, the owner of that house can use that fresh debt that was created by the bank that they received from you to buy other things in the economy. This means in our current system, if we want to have more growth, we need more debt. The key point here is that debt is actually money just from a different point of view. To the lender, it's an asset of money and to the borrower, it's a liability of debt. But they are one and the same. It sounds a bit complicated, but all you need to know is that when a bank issues a loan, it's not somebody else's savings. It's not money that the bank had. It's essentially brand new money that they create. They simply type it into a computer, and it appears as a digital representation of the government's money which you can spend. The beneficiary of this brand new money is actually the bank because they get to charge interest on that money and that's how they make a profit. Later, when you repay this loan, the debt disappears and the money also disappears but the bank's profit from the interest remains. The real estate and property markets are the largest tools for creating digital money. This is because banks have decided that it's the safest yet most profitable form of creating debt because if you can't repay the loan, the banks can simply take your house. In developed nations, vast amounts of money is backed by the mortgage market. In Australia, where I live, it's become particularly bad. For decades now, the banks have abandoned investment into the wider economy and have shifted their focus to investments in housing. This has pushed up the housing prices as people take on more debts to buy houses that they otherwise couldn't afford, but the banks make more money. This cycle over many decades has caused one of the biggest property bubbles on the planet. We're addicted to debt. Yes, we're, we're ad addicted to debt as individuals, as households. Um, you know, the ratios are way higher than almost every other country. So that's loans. But what about deposits? When you deposit cash into a bank, you are no longer the legal owner of that money. The banks are. They keep 10% of your deposits on reserve and can loan out 90% of that money to someone else. And that other person can deposit that money into another bank. And then that bank can loan out 90% and so on. This is known as fractional reserve lending. 
If they say, we'll transfer it to your account, that's wrong because no money is transferred at all. Because what we call a deposit is simply the bank's record of its debt to the public. Now, it also owes you money and its record of the money it owes you is what you think you're getting as money. And that's all it is. When all is said and done, an initial deposit of $100 with a 10% reserve requirement can ultimately lead to $1,000 in total money circulation. Well, at least that was how it used to work. Until March the 26th, 2020, there is now a 0% reserve requirement. According to the Federal Reserve, quote, this action eliminated reserve requirements for all depository institutions, end quote. So, banks can now create infinite amounts of money with no reserves. And it doesn't stop there. When banks hold your deposit, they can, along with hedge funds, gamble with it through investment in financial instruments, such as derivatives and securities. They do this in order to make superior returns. Most of the time, these instruments are basically just bets on if the price of an asset will rise or fall. But when taken to the extreme, it can get ridiculous. Remember in my Enron video how I talked about how they use financial instruments to bet on the weather? These crazy classes of financial instruments is what brought down the housing market and the subsequent global economy in 2008. But the problem today is that banks are playing with so many derivatives, sometimes stacked on top of each other, with leverage multiplying factors, that nobody actually knows how much money is tied up in this gambling. Some estimates put the derivative market at over $1 quadrillion, over 10 times the global economy. In booms, everyone takes on debt, that is, loans from a bank, and they spend it on things that they normally couldn't afford, but this causes economic growth. Eventually, people can't afford to take on more debt and can't pay it back, the banks stop lending and defaults start to take place, and the economy takes a downturn. This is natural and has happened over centuries, but in 2008, everything changed. The world didn't want to go through the pain of a downturn, and some analysts mark this as the very point that the real economy died. In 2008, banks had become so large, intertwined, and integral to the supply of money that when they were about to collapse, the governments had to use the central banks to bail them out. Remember, banks are creating 97% of all money as debt, and if this can't be paid back, it can cause a systemic failure, a risk of collapse of the entire global monetary system. Since 2008, the economy was dead, but has been on life support ever since. A decade of hyper-low interest rates, which basically make the cost of borrowing money free, have caused market distortions so large that it's compounded the entire problem. It was short-term gains for the consequence of long-term pain. When private banks make risky bets and incur losses, central banks can rescue them with their infinite wallet, as mentioned by Fed Chairman Jerome Powell in a recent interview for CNBC's 60 Minutes. Fair to say you simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally. So we, you know, we, as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And we do that by buying treasury bills or or bonds or other government guaranteed securities. And that, that actually increases the money supply. But by law, Chairman Powell's Federal Reserve can only lend money that must be paid back. We'll get to central banks in the next section. But as you'll soon see, we have to pay these debts back. All of this money that's being created is like that piece of paper we saw with the promise on it. Except it's signed by all of us, and we signed that we're going to pay this back through taxation. Us and our future generations. It's important to note that governments don't actually support the people. It's the people that support governments through taxation. Taxation and trade are the two major ways that governments can raise money. This raised money is used to pay back the central bank loans with interest. So when governments use the central banks to bail out private banks for their risky behaviour, the governments are left with the debt which eventually has to be paid back by the taxpayers in the future. So to recap, private banks create the vast majority of money, about 97% of it, 
and they do so by creating loans, which is debt. The process is as simple as typing numbers into a computer. Banks can, to an extent, spend and gamble consumer deposits as they legally own it. Two big-to-fail banks are backed up by the central bank, creating a moral hazard. And that...